Two years ago, I attempted to create my own 3D ray tracer completely from scratch. And you guys seem to have really liked that video. Although some of you were quick to point out the many flaws my implementation had. And yeah, while I got the idea right and managed to create some nice looking renders in the end, it was my first dive into this huge topic, so it had its shortcomings. The most questionable design choice I made was definitely to program the entire thing in Java without any graphics API, which is really not ideal for real-time ray tracing applications. That version also lacked some key features of ray tracing, notably global illumination, and it didn't really look that realistic. And to be honest, the reason for that is simply that I forgot that light and color are actually real things and not just something coming off a computer monitor. But who can blame me for that? Now that I've finally convinced myself to step outside my room and got to experience how light actually behaves in real life, I decided to give ray tracing another try. Let's see how that went. For starters, let's not use Java this time and instead go with C++. And most importantly, I'm going to use a graphics library, namely OpenGL so that we can use the GPU to draw things a lot faster. The main difference is that before, I wrote one program that would be executed by the CPU to draw each pixel one after the other. This is a huge waste, because the color of one pixel is independent of all the others, so there's no reason to wait for one pixel to be drawn before moving on to the next one. With OpenGL, we can write the code as a fragment shader, which is a program whose only task is to figure out what color a single pixel should be. The GPU can then execute this program many times in parallel, once for every pixel of the screen, which is obviously a lot faster. So, if we know what objects are in our scene and where the camera is, how do we figure out what color a single pixel should be? Well, let's do a small recap about the basics of the ray tracing algorithm. The main idea is that we want to simulate the path of light as well as the way it interacts with the scene. The intuitive approach would be to shoot many light rays from our light source and detect which rays reach the camera. However, this means we waste a lot of processing power simulating light rays that will never reach the camera. The solution? Shoot rays from the camera instead and calculate how much light should be reflected to the camera at the hit points. That way, we only need to care about the points in our scene which will actually be seen by the camera. We can calculate how much light from the light sources will be reflected from that point, which is called direct illumination, but also how much light from surrounding objects will be reflected, which is called indirect illumination. The indirect part is the trickiest, but is required to achieve global illumination and create very realistic looking renders. It is also something entirely missing from my last ray tracing engine, which is partly responsible for the fake look that one had. To compute direct lighting for a pixel, the program finds the closest intersection between the camera ray and our scene. The direction of this ray is the direction the camera faces, offset according to the pixel screen coordinates. Pixels that are directly in the center of the screen will shoot straight rays, while pixels that are more on the sides of the camera will shoot more divergent rays. The stronger this divergence, the wider the FOV, and also the more distortion we get. Once an intersection has been found, a ray is cast from the hit position to the light source. If the ray is blocked, the pixel doesn't receive any direct light, which is how shadows are created. If the path to the light isn't blocked, we need to compute how much light from the sources will be reflected to the camera. A simple way to estimate this is to multiply the light's color by the object's color, or albedo, and then multiply that by the cosine of the angle between the surface normal and the light direction. Because directions are represented by unit vectors, this cosine value is just the dot product of the two direction vectors. Also, when I say multiplying a color, I just mean multiplying the individual RGB values with each other, which only makes sense when these values range from 0 to 1, and not for example 0 to 255. One problem of this simple approach, however, is that the shadows we get end very abruptly, which isn't very realistic, as real-life shadows usually have smoother edges. This is because light sources like the sun or a light bulb don't just emit from a single point. 
Areas near the edge of a shadow can therefore receive a small part of the light that isn't completely blocked, which is called a penumbra. We can simulate this effect by giving the light sources a radius and casting multiple rays to different points on the light sphere. The proportion of rays that successfully reach the light is then used to calculate the received illumination. We can of course repeat all those calculations for multiple light sources with different colors to get some interesting looking results. At this point I wanted to add some user interface to my ray tracer that will allow me to change settings about the scenes like the colors and position of lights and spheres and see how they affect the result in real time. I could of course try to program a UI system myself or just reuse the one I created for my gravity simulator but I wanted something a lot more flexible and didn't want to spend too much time setting it up. I decided to try out Dear I'm GUI or Dear I am GUI, a C++ GUI library compatible with multiple rendering APIs including OpenGL. I was actually surprised at how easy it was to set up and use as it was probably the only C++ library I tried that didn't fill my console with compilation errors the first time I tried running it. So if you need a UI library for your OpenGL projects, you should definitely give this one a go. Now let's get started with the fun stuff, indirect illumination. The idea is actually very simple. For every point a camera ray touches, we can cast a bunch of rays in surrounding directions and treat every point we hit as its own light source, emitting the light it receives back but multiplied by its albedo. The complicated part is figuring out how much light from these points will be reflected by the initial surface back to the camera. We have to take the surface's roughness values into account, which is a material property that determines how much the light will be scattered over all directions. A roughness of 0 means all the light is reflected into a single direction, like a mirror, and a roughness of 1 means all the light is reflected evenly around the surface as normal, like a sheet of paper for example. This means that for a very smooth surface, points that aren't aligned with the reflected ray direction will almost not contribute any light to the final color. My first attempt at implementing indirect illumination didn't really work out that well, but eventually things started looking a lot better. There still is a massive problem though, noise. The reason for these noisy looking renders is that the program only casts a limited number of rays for every hit point, so the program tries to estimate how much light should be received in total, but these estimates lack sufficient information and can be very inconsistent from pixel to pixel. The obvious solution is just to increase the number of rays, or samples, but doing that exponentially increases the amount of calculations required per frame and severely reduces the program's FPS. Another solution is to use machine learning to more accurately predict the colors with fewer samples, which is what Nvidia's RTX technology does, but that seems way too complicated for me. Instead, I want to use something called progressive rendering. The idea is that instead of rendering every frame from scratch, we use the last rendered frames as additional information to render the current one. There are several ways to do this, but I decided on a very simple implementation. Basically, instead of directly rendering our scene to the screen, we first add the rendered frame to a buffer. By adding, I don't mean appending it to a list, but rather adding the RGB channels of every pixel of the frame we render to the RGB channels of every pixel already present in the buffer. We also keep track of the number of frames we have already added to the buffer. After doing that, we take what's in the buffer and divide the color channels by the number of frames already rendered, and render that to the screen. It's actually just a way of averaging all successfully rendered frames before drawing them to the screen. This way, if we use a different random seed to cast our rays for every frame, the image will eventually converge to the actual expected look. Of course, there is one massive downside of this approach, which is that moving the camera will make everything look like a blurry mess. To avoid this, I just clear the buffer every time the camera moves to re-render everything from scratch. This means we will still get significant noise while the camera is moving, so this approach does feel a little bit like cheating, considering our objective was to make it run real time. But I don't have a better solution for the time being. Now let's talk about reflections, the most recognizable feature of ray tracing. If you think about it, ray tracing is actually just a form of indirect illumination. Just instead of sampling in random directions, you sample along the reflected direction, 
or randomly inside a cone around the reflected direction to get blurry reflections. This is once again related to the surface roughness. If it is 1, we sample in all directions, and if it is 0, we only sample along the reflected direction. This is how that currently looks in our scene. It still doesn't look that good, but you can greatly improve it by adding a skybox. The skybox is a giant image that we can use to add an environment around our scene so that the background isn't just black. So if a ray doesn't hit anything, we can use a skybox to obtain a color anyway. If you don't quite understand how one image can wrap around the entire scene, think of it like a world map, but instead of representing the outside of a sphere, it represents the inside. We can just download one of these images online and use some handy math from Wikipedia to figure out what pixel of the image we should sample based on the ray's direction. One important thing to note is that we can download these images as HDR files, meaning high dynamic range. The difference between these files and normal PNG or JPEG files is that HDR images aren't restricted by a limited intensity range, whereas PNG files typically limit you to one byte per color channel per pixel. This allows things like the sun to be a lot brighter than the rest. Once again, this is a feature my last implementation didn't support at all. Here's how things look with the skybox. Now you might have noticed another issue. Reflections don't exactly look like the original objects. This is because currently indirect illumination calculations, which include reflections, only consider direct illumination. Calculating indirect illumination at one point should also calculate indirect illumination at the sample points in a recursive way. Luckily, we can just tell our function to call itself, which makes fixing the problem really easy. Right? So apparently GLSL doesn't support recursive function calls, which is quite a problem considering I wrote my code to specifically rely on this for global animation. So what do we do now? Guess it's time for a major rewrite. Yay! So I took a look at some existing ray tracing examples, particularly this one which I'll link in the description. The approach taken by the author is quite clever. Instead of sampling multiple rays per hit, we only focus on the path of a single light ray per pixel per frame. This will of course make our image very noisy, but it will also significantly decrease the time required to render a single frame, since we have a lot less rays to deal with. This means our progressive rendering pipeline will be able to produce a clear image quickly once we stop moving, and if the hardware allows it, we can even compute every pixel's color multiple times per frame and return the average to decrease the noise even while the camera is moving. Now that we always have one ray per intersection, we no longer need recursion, as we can simply use a for loop to iterate through the different steps of the ray's path. If we increase the number of iterations, we get more depth in our reflections, at the expense of performance of course. I then added a way to spawn new objects, select them and, as I was tired of just seeing spheres, I added a way to turn them into boxes. We now have pretty much everything we need to create beautiful 3D renders, but we can still add some simple effects to polish our images a bit. One problem we still have are these jagged edges that don't look realistic at all. This is something called aliasing and happens because all camera rays for a single pixel are always cast in the exact same direction which means that the pixel's color is entirely determined by a single point in the scene. To smooth out our edges, we should base a pixel's color on multiple points lying inside it. A simple way to do this without sacrificing frame rate is to take advantage of our progressive rendering pipeline and simply add a slight random offset to every ray's direction on every pass. Of course, if this offset is too big, we get a blurry mess, but even a very small offset is enough to decrease aliasing to unnoticeable levels. Another effect we can add is Bloom, which makes missive objects glow and can make things look a lot more photorealistic. However, Bloom is extremely difficult to get right, and what I did in my previous ray tracing video actually looked pretty terrible. Now the most important lesson I've learned from my previous attempt is Bloom looks best when it's kept subtle, 
so I'm always going to keep its intensity way down. Although there are many other features I would like to add, for example mesh rendering, volumetric lighting and transparent materials, I'm going to end this project here, for now. I just added one last feature, which is the ability to render simple animations with pre-programmed camera paths. These are of course not rendered in real time, as I want to have as little noise as possible. I've tried recreating the scenes I made from my last ray tracing engine in this new engine, and in my opinion, they definitely look a lot better now. Please let me know what you thought of this video and don't hesitate to point out tips you have or mistakes I made in the comments. But now before I end this video, I need to address the elephant in the room, which is of course the fact that I haven't uploaded anything for almost a year. I can assure you that this was not caused by a lack of motivation. I was actually extremely frustrated that I couldn't make more videos, especially considering the amazing growth the channel went through at the end of last year. Actually. Let's talk about that, I have no idea what happened. First, the Minecraft stop motion clips I created in the last video blew up on TikTok and other social media. Then Jake Eyes himself saw the video and gave me a shout out. And a few months later, one of my older, until then least successful videos blew up here on YouTube to levels never seen anywhere on this channel. And I was forced to look at this, unable to publish another video. So why was that? Why hasn't there been a new video in almost a year? Well, it turns out 2021 and 2022 happened to be very important years for me, where I had other stuff I needed to focus on, despite them being a lot less exciting than what I do here. The second reason was that I started about 5 different projects, and none of them seemed interesting enough to be the main focus of one of these videos. When the virus evolution video blew up, I dropped the project I was working on to create a sequel to that, but I quickly lost motivation, realizing I wouldn't be able to create something so much better than the first time in a reasonable amount of time. However, there was another sequel many of you were expecting, which is the one you are currently watching. I knew it would also take a while to complete, but the idea motivated me a lot more, and I truly hope you enjoyed it. Some of you also found me on Discord and have reached out asking what was happening, which was very nice. And so I finally decided to create a Discord server to make communication easier. The link will be in the description, and I hope to see you there. Now, this is where I'm going to end this video. I hope it was worth the wait, and in any case, new projects are coming soon. I hope. Well, let's just say new projects are coming and not promise anything about their time of completion. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.